Hey, six graders, it's Mr. McMahon. Uh, we're ready for a new unit of study. We're going to be talking about the Renaissance today. When we talked last, we were in the middle of the Middle Ages. We talked about feudalism, the manorial system, the Crusades, bubonic plague, role of the Catholic Church. And it was a pretty dark time, and some people call it the Dark Ages. And one of the reasons they call it the Dark Ages wasn't a lot of art, literature, science, architecture. We didn't really study that stuff. Well, now we're going to get into a time period that we call the Renaissance. And with the Renaissance, is really a rebirth of learning. If you remember, the Greeks and Romans did a lot of learning in architecture and art. And the Renaissance is really a rebirth of that. And so Europe is going to go through another time period where they value education. They're going to value art. They're going to value science, literature, etc. And so it's a really uh, impressive time of a lot of learning. And so the video follows, and I'm going to uh, tell you some things about the Renaissance and some important people that uh, played an uh, important role during that time period. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the Renaissance, and these are South Carolina six, Standard 661, basically summarizing contribution of the Italian Renaissance, and 662, identifying some of the key figures of the Renaissance. All right, so some essential vocabulary for uh, this video. First of all, textiles. They are materials that are made from cloth, uh, such as the clothing you're wearing, drapes that will hang over your windows and rugs, and the word literacies, the ability to read and write. So, for example, the adult population in the United States has 99% literacy, or 99% of adults in the United States can read and write. So the learning objectives for this. First of all, uh, summarize the contributions of the Italian Renaissance. Explain the importance of Florence. Summarize the philosophy of humanism. List the Italian accomplishments in art, music, literature, and architecture. Then identify some of the following key figures. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Johann Gutenberg. So here's a timeline of what we've been talking about in Europe. We just finished the Middle Ages. Today we're going to talk about the Renaissance. Next week, we're going to talk about the Reformation. And then in a few weeks, we're going to be talking about the European exploration. So, Roman number one, the Renaissance. The Renaissance, again, it's a rebirth of learning. It's kind of think about the what the Greeks and the Romans were like, and the Renaissance is going back to that time period and going back to what they idealized. So, we're going to see lots of things about art. We're going to look at ideas of critical thinking. And we're going to talk about some advances in uh, the field of education. All right, the or All right, so the Italian peninsula becomes the center or the beginning of the Renaissance, and it really is because it's the center of trade. If you'll notice, to the west is Western Europe. To the south and to the east is the Muslim world, and to the east is the Byzantine Empire. So being in the center of this allows them to trade, allows them to become wealthy, and so its geographic location of the Italian peninsula directly leads to Italy becoming the birthplace of the Renaissance. There'll be three main cities we look at, Milan, Venice, and Florence, and we'll spend some actual time more on Florence, Italy. So we're going to be talking about some city-states here in the Italian peninsula. A city-state is a city that includes its surrounding countryside, and it's an independent state. It is not a country. Um, it is basically a city in the surrounding countryside as its own independent state. All right, so the three uh, city-states we're looking at, Florence. Florence is famous for its textiles and its banking. Milan was famous for production of silk and weapons. And then Venice was a port city, so like Savannah or Georgetown or Charleston or Wilmington, it was a port city. Ships would come in and unload their goods, and they would trade and, and load goods back up and go back out. And they were famous for producing glass. So... Here's kind of the process. So uh, starting on the left, the Italian city-states first become involved in trade, which leads to number two, they become wealthy. Number three, once you have wealth, you have extra money you can create. You can uh, spend money on the arts. You can spend money on education. And finally, that leads to becoming what we know as the Renaissance. So what about the importance of Florence? Florence equals the birthplace of the Renaissance. So if we're thinking about the exact epicenter of the uh, Italian Renaissance, we're going to look at the city of Florence, Italy. So why is Florence so important? First of all, Florence has wool and textiles trade, 
which second leads it to become a very wealthy city-state. Third, merchants now have extra money. So what do they do? They put it in the banks of Florence, which again allows them to become even more wealthy. So Florence is a very wealthy city-state. There's a family in Florence who is very wealthy, and they're the Medici family. And the Medici family has some goals. One of the goals is to make Florence the most beautiful city in the world so that people want to come there. And so with their extra money, they pay artists to do sculpting, to do painting. They pay architects to make the most beautiful buildings in the world to be in Florence, Italy. And also they want their uh, citizens to be educated so they can work in their banks and produce lots of money. So education becomes very, very important to the Medici. So the Medici with their extra wealth kind of kickstart the renaissance with their money they can spend for all these extra things and it, it makes people want to become educated it gets lots of artists it gets lots of architects so florence italy it really becomes a center of um, renaissance culture it becomes a sentence of center of renaissance art and it becomes a center of renaissance literature so how does this philosophy of humanism influence the renaissance so what is humanism? Humanism is an idea that the people are going to go back and study the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. Humanism is about being human. And so you really want to strive to excel human abilities and human actions. You really study poetry, art, history, Latin, what we call the humanities today, the studies of being human. And they really want to understand the world around them. So it eventually is going to lead to European exploration. All right, so what about some of the accomplishments of art in the Renaissance? In the Renaissance, you're going to find a lot of paintings like the Mona Lisa on the left, and you're going to find a lot of sculptures like the sculpture of David on the right. You're going to look, we're going to look at two new artistic techniques. You're going to look at realism, and you're going to look at perspective. So realism. Realism is drawing things as they actually look. So you're going to see drawings of human anatomy. So like the picture of David here, where I've only shown the top half of David. It's going to be drawn showing David's anatomy. Second, it's going to, paintings and uh, sculpture are going, to, are going to show humans as they would look in real life. And it would even give their paintings and their sculptures emotional quality. So they look much, very much human. So this is called realism, making it real. Then you get the idea of perspective. You'll notice this painting here that's got St. Peter working with the poor. The lines aren't actually in the painting, but it's showing you perspective. In the foreground, you'll notice that you have people who are large um, because they're closer to you, and the people in the back are smaller. And so this really gives you perspective. It gives you that 3D look of perspective. So realism and perspective become important artistic techniques in the uh, Renaissance. You get some Renaissance artists. And the ones that we're going to look at are Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Botticelli. So we're going to start with the most famous of the Renaissance artists. His name is Leonardo da Vinci. He is an inventor. He paints the Mona Lisa. He's a sculptor. He paints the Last Supper. And with, because he has all these qualities, they call him the Renaissance man because he and he and he's an artist. He's a he writes literature. He's an inventor. He studies lots of different things he's a well-rounded man so we call him the renaissance man the perfection of what it meant to live in the renaissance then we got michelangelo michelangelo painted and sculpted in realism he painted the ceiling of the sistine chapel he sculpted the famous sculpture of david botticelli Botticelli was famous for two things. On the left, you'll notice um, he painted many religious themes. And on the right, he painted that famous family of, the, of Florence called the Medicis. All right, what about some accomplishments in literature and music? You have Johann Gutenberg. He, um, first of all, invented what we call movable type, which leads to the printing press. It leads to the Gutenberg Bible and it increases literacy because with the printing press, you can print thousands and thousands of books instead of one monk in a scriptorium taking one year to copy one copy of the Bible. The printing press can mass produce or create lots of copies of books. You get a writer by the name of Mike Mac Machiavelli. He's a writer and a politician. He gives advice to rulers on how to rule and he writes a book called The Prince. 
In the prince, he says that rulers should focus on the here and now. Don't worry about theory and how to rule. You worry how it's supposed to be right now. So if you're if it's time for war, then you act like it's time of war. So you rule for the here and now. And so Machiavelli was a writer and politician. Renaissance music. We really get into vocals. And because of the printing press, more people now can read music, so more people get involved in music. What about accomplishments in architecture? You get the influence of the Greek and the Romans. You get arches. You find lots of domes. You find Greek columns. And so the Greeks and the Romans influenced the Renaissance. And you almost look at some of these buildings, you think they were built with the Romans and the Greeks, but they're actually more Renaissance architecture. Some examples of this. Um, on the left, you'll see St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. You can see the arches and you can see the dome when it was built during the Renaissance. And on the right, you can see the Domo in Florence. Again, you can see the dome. So you see these examples of Greek and Roman architecture in these two buildings that were built during the Renaissance. What about Sutton? We're going to look at four scientists, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. First, Copernicus. Per Copernicus was one of the first Europeans to discover that the sun is the center of the, the universe or solar system. Before Copernicus, most Europeans thought the, the earth was the center of the solar system. So he was one of the first to know, hey, the sun is the center of the solar system. Kepler. Kepler discovers that the, or the planets orbit the sun in what we call ellipses, or more of an oval shape, that they're not in perfect circles. Galileo proves that Copernicus is right, but he comes in conflict with his own church, the Catholic Church, and they actually place him under house arrest. But he proved that Copernicus was right, that the sun was the center of the solar system and universe. And then Newton. Newton discovers gravity, and the, and the tale is that he was underneath an apple tree, and an apple fell, and he wondered why. And so he discovers gravity, which proves how the planets stay in orbit. We study the science of anatomy or the study of the physical body. And again, Michelangelo would have been one who really studied anatomy when he did his sculptures. He understood how the human body was put together. So what are some accomplishments in education? First of all, you got humanism, which makes people maximize their potential. So lots of studying of history, philosophy, and literature. And today we call this the humanities or the study of what it means to be human. The printing press, it leads to increased literacy rates. More people can read and write, which eventually leads to more schools and universities being built. So we see an increase in education. So some of the effects of the Renaissance, because of the increase in trade, it allows the Europeans or it causes them to have an increased interest in all the world around them, which directly leads to the age of exploration, which leads to the discovery of North and South America. So that was our video on the Renaissance. Uh, when we talk next week, we'll be talking about the Reformation. I'll see you then.